Hi everyone, I'm Fraser Kane. I'm the publisher of Universe Today. I've been a space and astronomy news journalist for over 20 years. This is the question show, your questions, my answers. And so wherever you are across my channel, if a question pops in your brain, just write it down and I will gather them up and I will answer them here. Now I do this show live every Monday at 5 p.m. Pacific time. So in addition to all of the questions that I pull from the YouTube comments, I will also answer your questions live. I have no idea what questions are going to be asked. It's a lot of fun. So if you can show up, definitely do 5 p.m. Pacific every Monday. Also, we have a code that shows up. I'm going to assume it's here. Um, that looks like the name from some Star Wars planet. And what these are is these are your votes for the question that you thought was the best, or maybe the answer that you thought was the best, the one that brought you the most joy. And so go ahead when you are asking a question or just typing in some comments into the YouTube, just go ahead and put that code word. And then next week, we will count up all of the votes and we will give a shout out to the person who ask the question with the most votes. And so this week, the shout out goes to Mozart Fisser for the question about how James Webb sees color. And so congratulations to Mozart Fisser for asking the question. I, I liked it. And I'm really glad I got a chance to go into the detail and answer that. All right. So remember, don't forget to vote. All right, let's get into the questions. President Mario. Hey, Fraser, what do the astronauts do in the event of a medical emergency? How about a dental one? Are the astronauts trained in extracting a painful tooth? The astronauts receive a couple of years of training just before they go on their mission to the International Space Station. And through that training, they deal with everything, mostly how they're going to deal with situations if they go wrong. And if someone on board the International Space Station has a dental emergency, the astronauts will turn to the ISS medical document. And this is a 1050 plus page document in both English and Russian that contains procedures for what the astronauts are supposed to do in the case of any kind of medical emergency. And I mean, any kind of medical emergency. Just when it deals with dental stuff, they have probably five different um, they you know, if you have if you need to have your crown replaced, if you have exposed gums, and even if you need to have a tooth pulled, they go through everything. And so for example, if you need to have a tooth pulled, they talk about how you can inject the drugs into the patient's gum area, how you can extract the tooth and how you're supposed to deal with post surgical recovery on board the station. So they can do temporary fillings, and they can deal with many, many, many other things. Now, obviously, it's ideal if someone with some kind of a medical background is on board the International Space Station, you can't always count on that. But there are enough people with some level of medical training or first aid, or being a medic that they've got a bit of a leg up. So yeah, unfortunately, when they're on board the station, they have to deal with these situations. In the worst case scenarios, someone can be evacuated into one of the spacecraft that are docked to the station, say one of the crew dragons or the Soyuz and return down to Earth. But it's never happened so far. And this is going to be taken to the next level when the astronauts go to say the moon or Mars, like think about it, with Mars, there is no way that you can just evacuate the patient back to Earth, you're gonna have to deal with the situation, or the patient dies, if it's extreme enough. And so this kind of medical training and all of these checklists that the astronauts go through will come in very handy as they move out and out into the solar system. Matthew. Fraser loved the show. Two dumb questions. Is the universe expanding chaotically, uniformly, or from a single region? Is it theoretically possible to see before the Big Bang, or is it that when a time we know as it began? Love and thank you and your team for all your work. So I'll tackle these two questions. First, is the universe expanding chaotically? And the answer is we don't know, but we assume that it is expanding evenly. And the reason why we don't know is because we haven't gone to every single nook and cranny of the entire universe and measured the expansion rate and said, Oh, what do you know, in this far flung corner, the expansion rate is 
expanding at a different rate. But from what we see and the theories that we have about the Big Bang, they match the universe that we see today. As we look in all directions, galaxies are receding away from us at an ever increasing rate at the same amount. And so the farther away something is the faster it is seen to be expanding away from us. And so astronomers assume that we don't live anywhere special in the universe that that the Earth and the solar system and the Milky Way is just a representative sample of what anyone would experience the laws of physics across the entire universe. And so if you went to some galaxy cluster that is a billion light years away, and you looked around you there, you would see all of the galaxies moving away from you at the same rates that we see from the Milky Way. So we don't know if it's chaotic, but we assume that it's not because if it is chaotic, then you kind of can't do any science you can't make any assumptions, you can't, you can't progress your theories forward. And this sort of exists, like, you know, same question, like, do the laws of gravity work differently on some distant planet? We don't know, but we assume it's the same. And over time, various tests of, of cosmology of gravity of electromagnetism are showing that the laws of physics as we understand them work in a larger and larger bubble around us. But at the end of the day, until we can actually travel billions of light years away, we can't know for sure that the laws of physics work as we understand them. Now, your second question was, is it possible to theoretically see the Big Bang? And the answer is no. Now, when we look off into space, we are looking backwards in time because the light is taking time to reach us. And so if we look a light year away, we are also seeing a light year back in time when we look at Alpha Centauri, which is four plus light years away, we are seeing that star as it looked four years ago, the light has been traveling all this time. When we look at Andromeda, two and a half million light years away, we are looking at Andromeda as it looked two and a half million years ago. And so you can extrapolate that out. And when we look at the farthest light that we can see, it's about 13.8 billion light years of time, that light has been moving towards us. And so we are seeing that time as it looked 13.8 billion years ago. And the light that we see is what's called the cosmic microwave background radiation, it is the time when all of the matter in the universe was glowing so hot, it was like the inside of a star, and light couldn't move through this material, it was blocked. And so we can't see beyond that point. But the mathematics can take us beyond that point. And what the math tells us is that about if you continue, if you take the expansion of the universe as we see it today, and you roll that back, then you get at a point 13.8 billion years ago, you get a point where all of that matter was compressed so tightly that it was like the inside of a star. And if you keep going backwards, about another 380,000 years before that, all of the matter that we see in the entire observable universe was compressed down to a region that was about the size of a volleyball. Now remember, it would have still been infinite. It's just that the region that we can see today was the size of a volleyball. And then it has been expanding ever since. And so we can't look beyond, we can't look beyond the cosmic microwave background with our own vision. There are possibly ways that we can see beyond the cosmic microwave background and in, in through neutrinos or with gravitational waves. But we will probably never have a way to be able to see before the Big Bang before the expansion of the universe began. It's possible there might be like some kind of after effect or ripples or some kind of of signal imprinted into the current universe that gives us a hint of what came before. But to the best of our knowledge, there's no easy way or no possible way for us to observe what came before this universe what came before the Big Bang. So so and why? Are there stars and galaxies below the Earth? Like all pictures seem like they're just taken above the Earth North Pole, it's hard to imagine there's anything below the South Pole. Will James Webb take photos pointing down? There's absolutely stars below the South Pole. The Earth is a sphere, and it is surrounded by a universe in all directions, up, down, right, left, forward, back. And you can find this out. Yeah, if you go to the North Pole, 
then when you look straight up, you'll be looking straight up at the North Pole star. But as you go down along the Earth, get down to the equator, the North Pole star will be essentially at your equator, no longer overhead, it's at the equator. And that's because you're going around the side of a sphere. And you can keep going all the way down to the South Pole. And now when you look straight up, you're looking at a completely different set of constellations, you're looking at the Southern Cross, I don't think there's like an like a precise star that is directly overhead. And also, when for example, if you live in the north, like I do, the moon looks a certain way in the sky every month, you see the crescent moon. And yet when you go to Australia, and you look at the moon, the moon looks upside down. It's a very weird experience. And when you're on the equator, the moon looks like it's turned over on its side. And so when you're up in the North Pole, or up in the northern hemisphere, the moon looks one way. And then as you go down to the equator, the moon looks like this. And then as you go down to the southern hemisphere, the moon looks like that, like when you see the crescent moon. And so yeah, there is universe in all directions, whether you're standing on the North Pole, whether you're standing on the South Pole, whether you're standing on the equator, everywhere you look, you will see universe and there are interesting things to observe. In the north, we have a lot of galaxies, we can see things like Andromeda, or M 33. A lot of really interesting galaxies, they're fairly galaxy starved down in the southern hemisphere, they've got the large and small Magellanic clouds, the dwarf galaxies that are orbiting around the the Milky Way. And in the north, we can't see them ever because they are only observable from the southern hemisphere. And so there are some objects that are visible only in the northern hemisphere, someone from Australia will never be able to see the North Star, while I will never be able to see Alpha Centauri, because it's only visible from the southern hemisphere. And the way James Webb is oriented, it is perpendicular to the sun, you can sort of imagine, like, here's the sun. Here's James Webb, imagine a line like this, James Webb can look sort of this way, and that way. So it can only look up and down, it can kind of turn around like this it can only look up and down, but it actually can't look completely opposite from the sun. So yeah, give it a try. Learn your constellations, go to Australia, and you'll just, your mind will be blown because you don't recognize anything in the sky. Black Banner Productions. If two ships are on a collision course at 0.6 C, wouldn't that mean that they are traveling at over the speed of light? You just discovered time dilation. So yeah, here on Earth, right, if you're driving in a car at say 50 kilometers per hour, and you're driving towards another car that is driving at 50 kilometers per hour towards you, then the combined speed is 100 kilometers per hour. And you would see that car approaching you at 100 kilometers per hour, it'd be exactly the same if you were standing still and you were watching the car coming towards you at 100 kilometers per hour. But with the speed of light, things get weird. And so the first rule, the number one rule of the universe is that light must go the speed of light. And nothing can go faster than the speed of light. And that the faster you go towards the speed of light, the more time changes from your perspective. And so I'll give you your example, you've got the point six C so you're traveling at 60% the speed of light. And so for every second that you experience on your ship, the rest of the universe experiences 1.25 seconds. And if you're able to get your spacecraft up to 0.99 C 99% of the speed of light, every second that you would experience the rest of the universe would be experiencing seven seconds. And you could just keep adding those nines to that number. And eventually, for every second that you experience the rest of the universe would experience minutes, they would be experiencing hours, days, months, years, decades, millennia, millions of years, and so you could imagine a time when you experience one second, and you're going to say 0 0.9999999 C, you know, some number, and the rest of the universe is experiencing millions of years for every second that you experience. Because when you go at high speeds, it's time that has to change. And so back to your analogy, and I don't know the exact numbers, I haven't sort of done the math on this. But if you've got two spacecraft that are approaching each other, you would think that they would be seeing each other coming at 1.2 times the speed of light, but you can't go faster than the speed of light. And so what happens is your perspective of time would change of you and the spacecraft that you're watching, so that it still remains under the speed of light. And that's the weird thing about time dilation and special relativity. And that is what 
Einstein figured out that is such a counterintuitive idea. So there you go. I uh, just 100 years too late. Roy Lindsay, why is the SLS booster orange? Is it rust? So if you look back in history, the original space shuttle booster was white. And then eventually the color was changed to orange. And you might wonder why. And the reason is because originally they painted the main fuel tank on the space shuttle. And after a while, they decided not to do it anymore. So the space shuttle main fuel tank, and it's the same thing as SLS. So we'll, I'll talk about the space shuttle and, and, and then I'll adapt it to the space launch system. So it is the giant fuel tank, the main fuel tank that the space shuttle used to fire its, its rocket engines. And it has liquid hydrogen and liquid oxygen inside of it. And both of those need to be kept very, very cold for them to be stable. And so the fuel tank, the main fuel tank is covered in a thick orange foam insulation. And originally, they would paint these white. And then they realized that in fact, it was just adding weight to the space shuttle. And so they decided, let's stop painting these things. And let's just leave them the, the color that the foam is. And so the space launch system is going to be using a similar uh, exterior foam to keep its liquid hydrogen and oxygen cool. And so what you're seeing is the same thing as the space shuttle, you're seeing just the foam that's there to keep the, the hydrogen oxygen cold. Axel James, I have a question about Titan as a fuel depot in the future. Can we get the methane, etc., from the surface without accidentally igniting it? Probably. Um, so yeah, it's pretty exciting that the surface of Titan seems to have hydrocarbons, it has lakes of methane, and methane is a rocket fuel. And so you're probably wondering, like, why doesn't this stuff ignite? Well, the problem is there just isn't enough readily available oxygen on the surface. So for you to have the fuel be ignited, you need both the fuel, but you also need the oxygen as the oxidizer. And so on Titan, you've got the fuel, you've got the methane, but you don't have the readily available oxygen. And so it can't ignite. But if you did land your spacecraft on Titan, then you're going to have to be very careful that you're not venting oxygen around you. Because that could help provide the oxidizer for the hydrocarbons that are on the surface. But my assumption is that they'll be able to figure out a way to do this safely. And so you can go to Titan, fill up your fuel tanks with methane, grab the water ice that's everywhere around it, break it up with electrolysis so that you've got hydrogen and oxygen, and then you can just take off from the surface of Titan, it would be a pretty great fuel depot when you think about it. there's literally pools, lakes of rocket fuel on Titan. More questions in a second. But first, I'd like to thank our patrons, Beatrix Lindner, Zachary Seifer, Jeremy Carrier, Scott Budd, Jim Jeffries, Beth Johnson, Dan Barry, Martin Kamen, and the rest of our 1058 patrons for their generous support. Want our videos with no ads? Join our community at patreon.com slash universe today. And I'll also remove all the ads from the universe today website for life. Chris Shelton, is it theoretically possible that the expansion of the universe could get so high that it would spaghettify all matter like being pulled into a black hole? Maybe. Um, so I'll give you a little bit of a, a history. So originally, when astronomers learned that the universe was expanding, that the farther a galaxy is, the faster it's moving away from us, they wanted to figure out what this meant. Would the universe keep on going forever? Or would it like coast to a stop? Or would the gravity of all the material pull it back into a big crunch again at some point in the future? So they went and looked for a very specific kind of explosion called a type 1a supernova. These always go off with the same amount of energy. And so when you see one, you know how much energy there is. And then you can measure the brightness that tells you how far away it is. And what they were expecting is that this would tell them that oh, the universe is slowing down, the expansion is slowing down by this amount. And that'll tell us when the expansion will stop or if it's going to just go on forever. And what they found is that not only is the universe not slowing down, but it's actually speeding up it's accelerating. And this is called dark energy. So then once you discovered this dark energy, and that it is somehow accelerating the expansion of the universe, the question you have to ask is, is this acceleration changing over time? Is it getting faster and faster, faster, if that makes any sense. And so if the 
acceleration is constant, then distant galaxies are going to fly away from us, and they'll fall over the cosmic horizon and we'll never see them again. But if the amount of the acceleration is increasing, then that means that eventually you'll get to a point where galaxies that are really close to each other are getting torn apart, and then galaxies themselves are getting torn apart, and then solar systems are getting torn apart, and then stars are getting torn apart, and then planets are getting torn apart. And eventually all matter is getting torn apart. And this idea is known as the big rip. And it's one possible outcome for the future of the universe. It's not gonna happen anytime soon, probably like 10 billion years from now, if it's real. And right now, where we stand today is that we don't know the answer. One possibility is that dark energy is constant. One possibility is that dark energy has changed over time and it's going to change into the future. And the best tool to help us figure this out is going to be the Nancy Grace Roman telescope, which is going to be launching in a couple of years. It is a successor. It's a twin of the Hubble Space Telescope, but it has a very wide field of view. And one of its main jobs is to measure the amount of dark energy in the universe over time and say, Oh, was the amount of dark energy per galaxies amount the same today as it was a long time ago, is dark energy constant, and if it is increasing or decreasing. So stay tuned in about five years, I'll be able to give you the answer to that question, a definitive, yes, we're all going to be torn apart and spaghettified or no, we won't ever be torn apart and spaghettified. Of course, it'll happen in billions of years. So it's not gonna be our problem, but it'll be the future universe's problem. Thomas Kingston, if I were to ride up a space elevator and step off the top, would I fall back to Earth? It seems like I would have reached the velocity to get into orbit. So the way that a space elevator works is that you build a elevator, a cable that runs all the way from the surface of the Earth up to geostationary orbit. And at geostationary orbit, the amount of time it takes for a satellite to go once around the Earth is exactly the same amount of time that the Earth turns. And what you end up with is a, a satellite from our perspective seems to hover directly above our point of view. And so if you took a cable and went from the surface of the Earth up to geostationary orbit, at the very top of that cable, you would be like a satellite, you would be floating around the Earth, you would be orbiting the Earth once a day, and the Earth would be turning under you and it would be stable. Now, the problem with a space elevator that is the distance from the Earth to geostationary orbit is all of the material, all the mass of the cable all the way up is pulling it back. And so it wouldn't be stable. And so the solution to that problem is you like put a big asteroid a little farther away than geostationary orbit and you tie the space elevator to the asteroid or you just double the length of the elevator. So if you have an elevator that is twice the length of geostationary orbit, so about 38,000 kilometers twice, then it could sort of free flow to be in perfect balance and it would be able to just gently touch one end and latch on to the earth and be able to turn around the earth once per day. And you could ride up on an elevator and you could step off the elevator and you would be in orbit. And then if you went any farther, you would be on your way out into the solar system. Sme self. If both form at the same time, which would last longer a white dwarf or a red dwarf? Thanks. So it's kind of a trick question. But I'll take a throw a bunch of numbers out and then maybe we can get to some kind of answer. So a white dwarf is the cooling remnant of a main Sukun star like the sun. And so when the sun uses up all the fuel in its core, it'll blow it out as a red giant, and then it will puff off its outer layers, and it will cool down, and it will become a white dwarf. And it'll be very hot in the beginning, it will be millions of degrees because it is literally the exposed core of a star. But then it will cool down over time and eventually become the background temperature of the universe. And then it's called a black dwarf. And so how long will that take? I mean, some estimates are that it'll be about 15 billion years, some estimates say it could be as much as a quadrillion years. So it's going to take a long time for it to cool down. What is a red dwarf? A red dwarf is a main sequence star, 
but that is very low mass compared to a main sequence star like the sun. And so because it is smaller, they're said to be fully convective, which means that they can mix up all of the hydrogen throughout the material, they will be able to use all of the fuel inside the star to turn themselves into energy. And so they can last a lot longer. They also sip their fuel at a, at a slower rate. And so it's estimated that red dwarf stars can last between a trillion to even 10 trillion years. But then when the star runs out of fuel, it becomes a white dwarf. Then how long will that last? And so I guess if you had a newly formed white dwarf compared to a red dwarf, then probably if they're about the same, I mean, if a white dwarf lasts 15 billion years, then obviously it goes first if the but if it lasts a quadrillion years, then it's going to last longer. Red dwarf star is going to last some amount of time, 10 trillion years, maybe. So I think the thing that's going to last the longest is a red dwarf star that then turns into a white dwarf star. Big Johnny Sachs, which would you prefer first the solution to dark energy or dark matter? You know, based on that answer that I gave earlier in the show about whether we would all get spaghettified. I think that I would like to know an answer to dark energy. I'd like to know what it is, because it seems to have implications for the very fabric of the cosmos. And if we could learn what dark energy is, why it's happening, and know that it's not going to tear apart the universe at an atomic level 10 billion years from now, uh, I think that would be more satisfying than to know what's causing dark matter. Because it, I don't know, like, like, obviously, it's billions and billions of years from now. And so it's not like it's going to cause any risk to me or my family or anything in the future, except, of course, when I have my robot body. But still, it's just something unsettling about the idea that that we have less time, we don't get the quadrillions of years that we wanted, we only get the billions of years. Alberto Menio, this is maybe a funny question for the savvy here. But does the moon not fall to the Earth? Thank you. It's a good question. And it's a question that people have been puzzling for hundreds of years. Why is the moon up there in the sky? And why does it not fall into the earth? And it actually took Isaac Newton to figure out the answer to this question. Sort of the classic story is that Isaac Newton saw an apple fall from a tree. And then he thought about how the apple moved accelerated as it reached the ground. And then he looked at the moon and he said, it must be the same thing is happening to the moon. And so why is the moon not falling into the earth? And the reason is because the moon is going in orbit around the earth. And so an example, you know, an experiment that you can do yourself is that you can fill a bucket with water, and then you start to spin the bucket around your head. And you can make it so that none of the water falls out of the bucket while you're spinning it faster and faster and faster. And the reason is because you're creating centripetal force, the at the rotational speed of the water around your head is causing an outward force on the water that is keeping it pushed into the bottom of the bucket. And so when you think about the Earth and the moon system, the Earth is pulling on the moon with gravity, but the moon is orbiting around the Earth. And so it's got an outward force and those two forces are in perfect balance. And that keeps the moon in orbit around the Earth. And it's the same reason that astronauts and the space station are able to stay in space because they have the gravity of the Earth pulling them down, but they also have their their rotation, which causes an outward force that makes them want to fly out into the universe. And those two are in perfect balance. And so you get orbit. KSMI, scientists keep saying it's impossible to go the speed of light, but have any of them tried? Absolutely, they've tried. At the Large Hadron Collider, scientists put particles, protons, into a magnetic field, and then they run them through this magnetic field, and they accelerate them faster and faster and faster. And they're able to get to like 0.999, I forget the exact number, but really, really close to the speed of light. And the more they get closer and closer to the speed of light, the more energy is required to accelerate these protons, essentially, the more massive they become from the perspective of the accelerator and the amount of electricity that's required, and it would require an infinite amount of energy to get these protons to be able to go the speed of light. And so absolutely, they've tried and uh, they haven't been able to go the speed of light. Richard DeJardin. I've been thinking a lot about Medi, and I'm interested to know what you think would be the most efficient or low maintenance way to broadcast our existence with current technology. Well, the first ethical question that we have to deal with is, is it a good idea to broadcast our existence to the universe? Um, 
I think the jury is still out on that. Uh, but whether or not it's a wise idea to broadcast our existence to alien civilizations. But let's say that we did decide that the universe is safe, all the aliens are friendly, and all they want to do is share knowledge and enrich our lives. And so how do we let them all know that we're out there. And so the best way to do that, although it's not quite our current technology is to send some kind of spacecraft that is in orbit around the sun, maybe like a big space station or something made of mylar like a solar sail or something that is a weird shape, like a triangle. And so you've got this artificial space station that is transiting in front of the star from the perspective of some other civilization, they watch the sun and notice that every two days, the sun dims by an amount and the shape of the dimming is this really weird shape that can't be produced in nature, you'd expect a sphere, you get a triangle, it's an obvious signal that there is some kind of advanced civilization here on Earth, or in this solar system. And so it's a good idea, because once you've launched it, then it's just in orbit forever. And then you don't have to modify it or mess with it, you just leave it. And you could put multiple of these things into different orbits. And so you there they would be visible from different angles of the galaxy. And so maybe if you had very specific star systems that you were looking to target and remind them that we exist, then you could build these space stations and they would just last for billions of years. So that's probably the, the lowest energy over the long term way to do it. In the short term, you probably want to use lasers, very, very bright lasers that you shine at some star system and then you turn it off and on to try and provide some kind of coded signal. But I like the idea of space stations. What's cool about that is that we can look for that. We can look across the universe for other star systems that are surrounded by these giant space stations. And that would tell us that we're not alone in the universe. Astronomers have looked for them. And so far, they haven't seen any. Mike Kinney, they say James Webb will be able to image the first stars and galaxies. How do they know which way to point to locate them? They'll look in any direction and they will see them. Because remember, when we look out into space, the farther we look, the more we're looking backwards in time. And when you think about say the Hubble deep field survey, where they took the Hubble Space Telescope, and they pointed at what was seemingly a completely empty part of the sky. And they just let it collect light for days and days and days, what seemed to be empty space was actually filled with countless galaxies. And the reality is, is that there were way more galaxies in that picture, but the Hubble Space Telescope is only able to see near infrared visible light and ultraviolet. And so at the greatest distances in the universe, as galaxies are moving away from us faster and faster, their light is being redshifted way into the infrared. And so Hubble couldn't see them. But if you took James Webb and you pointed at that exact same spot in the sky, it would be able to see all of those galaxies that Hubble wasn't able to see. And so the reality is, is that James Webb will be able to look anywhere, and it will see galaxies forming just after the Big Bang. Komar 323. Would it be possible that we are inside a nebula now given that nebula are so faint? If we were inside a nebula, we would probably know it. But you're exactly right that nebulae are actually quite faint. You know, we see these pictures of the Eagle Nebula, the Pillars of Creation, or the Orion Nebula, and they look like these beautiful, multicolored, amazing places. But the reality is, is that we can only see that because a telescope camera is able to record light for very long periods of time. If we went and flew on a spacecraft into the middle of the Orion Nebula, what should be this incredible, beautiful sort of nebula in front of us, we wouldn't see anything. We might see a slight haze. And that would be it because our eyeballs, our meat cameras cannot record information for long enough. And so we could be inside of a nebula. And what effect that would have is that that would make the the rest of the universe appear a little more obscured, it would be like a little harder to see out to see things. And astronomers have been able to detect the amount of dust that's in the solar system and get a sense of how that impacts our astronomy. That if you took something like say the Hubble Space Telescope, and you took it out beyond the orbit of Neptune or Pluto, you'd be out of most of the dust in the inner solar system, and you'd get a better view to the cosmos than if you did here, but it's not worth it. 
because it's way easier to launch a spacecraft and operate it close to the Earth. You get a slightly better view. And so if we were in a nebula, our view to the cosmos would be slightly degraded, but not a lot. Anne Own, what new telescope experimental observations are you most looking forward to this year? The Vera Rubin Observatory. This is like by a factor of 100. I am so excited about the Vera Rubin Observatory. And I've been I know I've been going on it about it for years now. I've done videos about Vera Rubin. I've done I've brought it up again and again and again. And if you don't know what Vera Rubin is, it is going to be an eight meter telescope. So the same size as some of the largest telescopes in the world, but it's going to have like the largest camera detector ever made. And it will observe the entire southern night sky in about three days and just observe at an incredible depth and sensitivity. And then it will just be dumping all of this data onto the internet. And then three days later, I'll come back and look at the same spot. And it's going to find everything that changes in the universe. And that's really exciting. It's a whole new dimension of astronomy that very little it's called time domain astronomy, and very little work has been done in time domain astronomy, because these tools haven't existed. But you know, you think about when astronomers back in the day would take a picture of the sky and they take another picture of the sky and then they would flip between them the photographic plates. That's how they found Pluto is is through this time domain astronomy. But imagine the whole sky being done at this incredible sensitivity, you're going to see supernova, you're going to see asteroids, you're going to see comets, you're going to see weird, interesting things happening to stars, things changing in brightness, and then a whole class of objects that we just never even knew were there, we will suddenly find them. And I'm I'm so excited about the Vera Rubin Observatory. And it's been a long time in the making. And we should see first light later this year. And like, if I had to choose between James Webb and Vera Rubin, I would probably choose Vera Rubin. That's how excited I am about this telescope. All right, those are all the questions that we had this week. Thank you, everyone who posted your questions in the YouTube comments. I read them all. I collect as many of them as I can to answer here. It's a lot of fun. And of course, we record this show live every Monday at 5pm Pacific time. So if you want to join the show live, you can just come to the YouTube channel, there'll be an event somewhere already on my channel where the next one's gonna happen. So just click on the notification bell, and you'll get an announcement when I go live. All right, we'll see you all next week. If you want a single comprehensive resource for space news, you want to subscribe to my weekly email newsletter. Every Friday, I send out a magazine of space news with dozens of stories, pictures, brief highlights, and links so that you can find out more. Go to university.com slash newsletter to sign up. It's totally free. And did you know that all my videos are also available in a handy audio podcast format so that you can have the latest episodes as well as special bonus material like interviews with me show up on your audio device. Go to university.com slash audio or search for universe today on iTunes, Spotify, or wherever you get your podcasts. And I'll put a link in the show notes. Thanks to all the moderators and a special thanks as always to Chad Weber, Nancy Graziano and Anton Poznikov.